I'll just go through this chapter really quickly, just because sometimes when you read through the Gospels, or sometimes when you read through chapters, you just think it's like saying just random things, and you're not really making the connection between all the different verses. But when you sort of like look at a passage more closely, you can kind of see the connection and the flow of thought that's happening through Matthew 6. So first of all, he talks about giving, right? So you're giving of your arms. So this, you know, in our day and age, we'd just be donating to causes, right? Donating to church, donating to different causes, giving money to other people. Um, so that's the first thing, right? Where he says basically don't give for the sake of people seeing you. It doesn't, it's not wrong that people know. Like it's not wrong... Like, for example, like Ananias and Sapphira, they sold a piece of land and people knew that they were giving that to the church. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, what was wrong with Ananias and Sapphira is because they, they said they were going to give this much and they didn't. So that was, they're trying to be seen of men, right? So you can see their heart. They're doing it to be seen of men. But if you do it not to be seen of men, you know, and people are just accusing you of that, obviously people can always judge motives wrong. So it's not saying that you can never be seen giving, right? It's just saying it's a heart issue, right? It's like, what are you doing it for? Are you doing it to be seen of men? If you do, then you're not going to get the reward you could get if you did it with the right heart. So he's saying, you do it, if you do it in secret, then God's going to open you, uh, reward you openly. And not meaning necessarily in this life, because when we are rewarded in heaven, it's going to be open. That's why, when, that's why people misunderstand that passage where it says, if you confess me before men, I will confess you before my Father, because when the rewards are doled out, it's going to be before God the Father. So it's not that we are being denied salvation, it's when we are seeking our rewards, it's like we're getting denied the rewards that we should have got. So there's that denial as well, as opposed to confessing your name before the Father, which is your salvation in Revelation. Um, so first it's the giving of alms, so you can see here, and then, then he goes on, so it's the giving in alms of secret, then it's the praying in secret, so you notice that these are the things that you shouldn't be doing for men, so it's the alms, the giving, you're going to get rewarded, then he goes on to, well, when you pray, you pray in secret, then it goes on to how to pray, so you see how it follows on, and then he gives a model prayer, and he says, don't use vain repetition like the heathen do. Um, sometimes the Catholic and Orthodox do that as well. They have their prayer book, and they just have vain repetition where they're just repeating it. And some of denominations even just turn the prayer that Jesus says into a vain repetition, and they just say, how many our fathers? And he says, you think you're going to be heard for your much speaking? And he's like, no, you're not, that's not how you pray, right? You, just, you pray by he's giving us a model, a guide of how our prayer should be modeled. Um, they have their reward and they pray. And then, so then there's giving, there's prayer, and then there's fasting. So those are the three things he touches on in here where if you, if you do them for the right reasons, you get rewarded for them, right? So, then fa so the fasting is, hey, don't fast just to be seen. That's why when you fast, he's saying you anoint your head. and what, So he's saying like when you fast, you don't just like, oh man, I'm fasting. I'm just like, you know, sometimes that work, people are like, oh, they just look disheveled and they ask, I'm fasting. But he's like, you don't, it shouldn't be like that, right? You should be, when you fast, you just, just look normal. So that God knows you're fasting, but you're not doing it for the world necessarily to see. So this is now in context of now he gets to 19 and he says, thinking now, lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth grow, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. So how do you lay up those treasures in heaven? Well, he just explained what's how you use your resources. You're praying and you're fasting. So that's how you lay up for yourselves treasures. So how you use your resources in this earth is how you can lay up treasures in heaven. But it's also your prayers and the fact that you're fasting. And then you can see as he goes through, where your treasure is, where will your heart be also. So now he starts that comparison of the earthly treasure and the heavenly treasure. So he's saying, hey, whatever you're focused on, whatever you're trying to get, you're trying to get the earthly treasure, which is the praise of men, you know, and then and rather than the praise of God. So that's the there. And now he says, because now you need to make sure your eye is single, because it's like he goes on to the no man can serve two masters. So first of all, he talks about, hey, where are you focusing on? You can't serve two masters. So you see how, like, it's actually all, like, it all flows, right? And then when he's talking about, like, the earthly mammon and the heavenly rewards, that's where he says, you, you take no thought for your life. So he's saying you don't have to be concerned about those things. Yes, do you need to work? Do you need to be responsible about those things? This is not saying, because a lot of people say this, like, oh, you know, just leave it to God. No, what this, this is not saying that you, you don't, think about it at all what this is saying is that you don't, don't worry about these things when you take thought for it it's not that you shouldn't know what you're going to work and how you're going to make your money how you're going to provide for yourself it's that you just do what's right like the bible says later you seek first the kingdom of god you work hard 
And don't worry, if you work hard, you're going to be provided for. It's not something you have to be stressed about, thinking, oh, you know, take no thought, you know, don't take any thought from my don't stress. Like, oh, what if this happens to me? What if, this, what if I do this and then this happens and then I'm going to be stuck? Like, that's the sort of thing that the Bible is saying. You don't worry about that. You leave those things to God. And we can apply that thinking in many areas of our life where we stress about things we can't control. Right? And the Bible is saying, like, you know, just don't, you, those are the things you can commit to God. You just seek first the kingdom of God. So he's particularly talking about just clothing and raiment here, just your basic necessities you don't even have to worry about. And then he compares how God provides for nature, and um, they, they are even arrayed more than Solomon. And he says, hey, if he's taking care of them, why don't you think he'll take care of you? Are you aren't you more valuable than the, the lilies of the field and the grass of the field? And this is what I want to focus on in my sermon today, is verse 33. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. I love this phrase. This is one of my favorite phrases in Matthew 6. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. What is he saying there? He's saying there's enough things to worry about today to worry about things that you can't control in the future. Right? So it's like he's saying there's enough evil in the day to worry you. So even if you were worrying about it, which you shouldn't, why even worry about the future? Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. So how do we get rid of that worry? Well, we need to seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And some people misapply this verse, especially the prosperity preachers, right? Because they say, all these things shall be added unto you. They say, well, put God first and you're going to be healthy, wealthy, wise, you know, have a great marriage, all these things, right? Um, you know, have all these earthly riches, which is what obviously Jesus is preaching against, you know, and saying, don't lay up treasures on earth. But then some people take this verse to see like, ah, you know, your business is going to do well and you're going to have a house and you're going to be comfortable. No, no, he's just saying all these things. What were the, these things? The, these things were the food and raiment. So it's just your basic necessities, right? He's not saying that you're going to have, you're going to be wealthy, healthy and wise. Um, he's just saying, hey, God will take care of your basic necessities if you seek first the kingdom of God. So what we have to focus on is seeking God first, putting God first. So that's the title of my sermon this morning. That's the topic I want to talk about, is having the right priorities. Having the right priorities. How we prioritize our life and how things, how relationships should be prioritized. So I've got four that I want to go through today where obviously we're springboarding off Matthew 6. So there's four I want to talk about. Number one, obviously, and we'll start at the most obvious place, is God. God comes first. And I don't think that's a surprise to anyone that God should come first. Obviously, doing that is a lot harder than knowing what's right. That's why you don't want to just be a hero of the word, but a doer as well. Because if you don't do it, you forget, and then your life, you just start not prioritizing the things of God. So I want to talk through how should the rest of our things be prioritized in light of this, right? So first one is God. So in Matthew 6, we saw, seek ye first, not seek ye second, not seek ye third, not seek ye after you, like after you've done your things, then you seek God. No, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things, so that these things, your basic necessities that you don't have to worry about, that you can leave to God, the things that are out of your control, shall be added unto you. 1 Corinthians 10. Whether therefore ye eat or drink. So things as mundane as eating and drinking. Right? The Bible says, whatsoever ye do. Do all to the glory of God. So everything you do has God in consideration, even to the point of just how you live. Because you know what? It's not just the things that you do that other people can see that we should be seeking first the kingdom of God. What about all the things that people don't see? All the things you do in private, how you spend your private time. That as well needs to be done all to the glory of God. So it's not just when people see me, I put God first. You have to also in private, right? That's why it's whether therefore you eat or drink, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Matthew 22, familiar passage. But when the Pharisees had heard that he had put the Sadducees to silence, they were gathered together. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him and saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. No question that God comes first. And the second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all 
the law and the prophets. So what are some common ways that people don't put God first? Well, we're in church this morning. That's one way people don't put God first, right? They don't prioritize church. Some people, they work on Sundays. Now, I understand that, you know, sometimes people transition from an old lifestyle to a new lifestyle and they're still trying to transition out of working on Sundays. But ultimately, we've got to try and transition to prioritizing the house of God and the church of God where we can work. We have six days to work, right? But one day we should come to, to church and not necessarily work on Sundays. So that's one way people prioritize themselves over God is that they, they do things that they need to look after themselves and they're not in God's house. They're not at church. Um, what about another one? Like working so much that you don't have time for ministry. So sometimes you may be working six days a week and you're coming to church on Sunday and then you go to work Sunday night and you're just working so much that you can't do anything but attend church on the morning. And that's not healthy either because you know what? Part of your spiritual life, to be healthy in your spiritual life, you need to do some work. Like just imagine in your physical life if all you did was just dine out at a restaurant once a week and that's all the Bible you got, that's all the food you got. I mean, how malnourished would you be as a person? That's why we need to be reading our Bibles all the time. We always need to be thinking on God's Word because you need to be feeding yourself spiritually throughout the week. And you know what? If all you did was eat, if all you did was read your Bible and listen to the preaching and you did nothing else, I mean, you, if, if, if some of us, if you were to put on spiritual glasses and look at some Christians, they would just be like these obese people just like in their couch just can't move, you know, because of all the Bible knowledge they've got, but of all the lack of work that they're doing, right, to work off all that energy that they're getting. So we need to make sure not only we have time to be here listening to the preaching and, listen, and, and fellowshipping, but we've got to spend some time fellowshipping, serving one another, spend time soul winning. We need to make time for those things in our life. So that's how we make sure we put God first, that when we are thinking about our schedule, God's things go in first to make sure that they are in there. That's how you prioritize. You prioritize by putting something first. It's no different to money, right? If something's prioritized with your money, that money goes away first, right? So same with your time. If you're prioritizing the things of God, you think, what am I going to do in this week? Well, when you think about, okay, your Sunday, boom, church is already there because putting God first. You know, there's other ministries that might be that you need to do too. They go in first and then you work around that as opposed to the mindset of, well, you know, I don't have anything else to do on Sunday. I may as well go to church. That's how you know you're not prioritizing the things of God. But when you're prioritizing the things of God, you know what? It's like, I'll never do something on Sunday morning because I already know where I am. I already know where I am for the next year, 10 years, because I'm going to be here. So I don't have, I don't have to think like, what, what am I going to do on Sunday mornings? I already know what I'm doing Sunday mornings. I'm here. So um, that's another one. Not, have, not giving enough time for ministry, prayer and fasting, obviously. Not giving time for prayer and fasting. What about giving? Where people prioritize spending all your money on yourself. Worldly pursuits not giving anything to the cause of God, not giving anything to the church, not giving anything for causes that are more important than just yourself. That's how people don't prioritize the things of God as well. Also, like in relationships, either dating or business relationships, where people do not seek first the kingdom of God. Think about people who have unequally yoked relationships, where they're da dating an unbeliever, right? and they're dating an unbeliever, that's where they're not prioritizing God in their life. Because if God was prioritized in their life, they'd do what's right by God first rather than what they're seeking. It's the same with business relationships. You don't want to go into business with somebody that's unethical, questionable, sinful practices, thinking, well, I'm just going to make money and, you know, I can, I can use this money for God. You can be a bit like Saul, right? You know, disobey to try and give something to God. That's not what God wants. God says to obey is better than sacrifice. So that's how you prioritize God. When you obey God, God doesn't need money. God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Have you heard that, hill, that hymn or that, that kid song? God, God owns the world you know, he's, and the fullness thereof. God doesn't need money. So the only reason why God gets us to give is not because he needs money. It's because it shows that we love God. It's a chance for us to show our love to God by giving him something. It's not because he needs it, right? He, will, he has the resources that he needs, but it's our opportunity to be a blessing and to earn rewards, right? Lay up treasures in heaven. So thank God we have the opportunity to give because that's, that's one way we can earn rewards in heaven. 
So unequally yoked relationships, you know, people staying in a bad relationship, not putting God first, putting the emotions of their unequally yoked partner before God. How many times have you seen that where they don't want to break off that relationship? Why? Because they're going to hurt that person. You know what? One thing I had to learn the hard way in my life is it's better to break that relationship and do what's right by that person. See, the thing is, if, if you truly love somebody and you're dating somebody that's not saved and you're physically and intimately involved with them, to break off that physical, physical intimacy is actually more loving than staying with them. Right? But when you're in the flesh, you think, well, oh, I don't want to hurt them, I don't want to disappoint them. That's actually the less loving thing to do because now you're showing them that you're not putting God first, that spiritual things are not important. You have to have the right mindset when it comes to dating and relationships. So um, that's one way people don't put God first. Now what's the second one? So God needs to come first. Second one is family. Now let's just read through Ephesians 5 first and I'll give you some thoughts there because I think there's a lot of misconceptions about what family is. Uh, Ephesians 5. <clears throat> Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, <coughs> even as Christ is the head of the church and he is the saviour of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it even as the Lord, the church. For we, are his, for we are members of his body, of his flesh and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in, in, in particular so love his wife, even as himself and the wife see that she reverence her husband. So now what do I mean when I mean by family? Because when I think of family, and even I still say it myself just because when I, when I think about my, my, my unsaved brothers and sisters and extended family, you call them family. But what is really a family in the Bible? A family starts from husband and wife. So even though you may be related to people and they're like extended family, families, according to the Bible, are actually independent organizations if that makes sense just like the churches are independent families are also independent so when does that independent family start well the bible says here for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother so it's not that you're no longer related to them it's that you are starting an independent family that answers directly to god so that's why it's i think this teaching is very important because a lot of cultures get this idea that they have to keep obeying mom and dad they have to keep obeying the traditions of great granddad or great 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 granddad and it's like I, i'm part of this family i have to do it no when you start your own family when you leave father and mother and the father now remember is the head of that family and the head of the man is christ so that's why that family it should be needs to take the stand and answer directly to god and not keep saying following obligations that may be unbiblical or wrong just because you think, oh, it's because my parents told me to do it, my grandparents want me to do it, we have to respect the family. Respect is fine, but that doesn't mean obedience. You don't just blindly obey and you don't, you're not obligated to obey, right? Because you are actually a separate family now. So when I talk about priorities and I say God and then family, what I'm talking about is that entity. I'm not talking, because I'm going to talk about later extended family and friends and whatnot. That comes much later on, right? Because they are not the priority, right? But yes, you have a priority to your family because you have a priority to, to, um, uh, to take care of them. So that's what I mean by family. I mean husband and wife and any children that are in their house. It's a little bit different with men and women because what I believe about family is that women, women always belong to their father, right? But men are, men are independent. But eventually a man grows up. When a man is in his father's and mother's house, obviously they have authority over him because he's in their house. But one day the man, can, when he wants, he can decide to leave father and mother and get married. 
right? So he can leave father and mother and start his own family and then he is independent. So it's like the way I believe it works is like when, when a man, when a, when a boy is in his father's house, he's under authority. But he can leave at any time and be his own authority when he leaves that house. Women can't, right? Women are under the authority of their father. When they get married, they are under the authority of their husband. But men have that autonomy because they are accountable directly to God. So when a boy grows up and he's old and he decides to go out and sow his wild oats like the prodigal son, he's he can do that. He's accountable to God, right, for what he has. Uh, women don't. That's why it's a man leaves his father and mother, establishes a new family. Women shouldn't be leaving father and mother to go and do those things. They, they are under the authority of their father until they get married. That's how God has things, has things working. So, <clears throat> um, so that's what I mean by family when I talk about family. Now, why does, why does husband and wife come second after God? Because some people, some mothers may say, and maybe some fathers may say this too, well, they'll say things like, oh, you know, I'll do, I'll do anything for my children. You know, I just live for my children. You know, they think, they think their priorities is God, then children, then husband, or God, then children, then wife, which is not correct, yeah. right? What's, what's correct is God, your husband or wife, then your children. Yeah. So when you say, when a woman says something like, I'll do anything for my children. Well, will you do anything for your husband? Because you're not commanded to do anything for your children. But you know what you're commanded to do? You're commanded to do anything for your husband, right? So it says here, so let the wives be to their own husbands uh, in everything. Talking about obedience here. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands. Look, in everything. Now, this does not negate the fact that we have to obey God first, right? So we talk about priorities. So when it says you obey your husbands in everything, it doesn't negate the fact that God is above there. So the husband cannot command something that is, that is uh, contrary to God's commandments, right? But everything that is not contrary to God's commandments, a woman is expected to obey. So you see here that that's why spouses come next, same with the husband. That's why it says here, um, husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. So just like a woman shouldn't be putting children above her husband, a man shouldn't be putting his kids above his wife. Are you, are you willing to die for your children? Or are you willing to die for your wife? One is commanded, right? Specifically, right, in this context. That we should love Christ, uh, love our wife as, as, uh, as Christ loved the church. So that's why family in terms of husband and wife is very important. And then after husband and wife is you have children. So we have obligations, obviously, to people within our home. We have obligations to take care of our children, and sometimes to take care of extended family, take care of our parents. Right? So I'll just show you some verses there. So here... We see, this is why I believe spouses come after God, right? So God and spouses, because there's a very special relationship there where you're one flesh, and then those two people that are one flesh have obligations to the children that they bear and also their parents as well. They have obligations, but they don't come before the spouses. So if we go into Ephesians 6, we see this. We see... <coughs> Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. So when I talk about children, see, I think this always applies to women, right? Because women are always under their father. But when it comes to, um, and obviously not to disobey God, because like I said, God is always above your parents. But children here, when, it, when you're thinking about a, a man in terms of, you know, parents telling him what to do, when he becomes a man and he leaves father and mother, he doesn't always have to obey your parents. So I know some people take this verse. And this is why it's, 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 it matters when you think about family, right? Because this is in the context of family as well. Some, some parents in Christian circles think of this verse and just think that means their kids should always listen to them, right? But that's why it's children obey your parents in the Lord. It's not men obey your parents in the Lord because one day you become a man and you don't need to obey your parents anymore. You're responsible for yourself. Unless you are living in their home, that's a bit different, right? You have to answer them. So children obey your parents. It's not just you obey your parents no matter what. 
Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. And why do I say this? I'm not trying to encourage rebellion. What I'm, what I'm saying is, because sometimes, sometimes your parents will get you to do things that are not biblical. You know, it's different if children are just disobeying their parents, like good, solid advice, you know, biblical advice. I'm just saying that sometimes there are traditions, when we come from different traditions, we come from Chinese traditions and Orthodox traditions and Catholic traditions, all these other traditions, these pagan traditions, you don't just obey your parents because they have some superstition and you think you have to obey your parents. That's when you disobey, right? Because God comes before them. For this is right. So that's why it says, obey your parents in the Lord. So it's not, I don't think this is just saying only obey your parents if they're saved. I'm saying, I think this is saying obey your parents if they tell you to do something that's aligned with God, right? For this is right. Honour thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. So you see the different directions there. Children obey parents. Parents need to raise children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. But also, you need to honour your father and your mother. Now, what does it mean to honour your father and your mother? It doesn't just mean, it doesn't only mean respect. So you, of course, you need to honour them in terms of show them the respect that they deserve. Respect doesn't always mean you need to obey them, right? You can respect somebody whilst respectfully declining the command that they're giving you, right? So you need to always show them respect. That doesn't mean you always do everything they say. They tell you to do something that's wrong or against conscience or against, uh, against the commandments of God. But this is not just respect. There's more to honour than just respect. Honour is also providing for them when they need help. So we have an obligation, guys, to take care of our parents when they need help. You know, some of us may not have the most ideal parents, but that doesn't negate, it's just like marriage, right? You may not have an ideal spouse, it doesn't mean you don't love them. It's the same with your parents. You may not have ideal parents, but when they come down on hard times and they need help, God expects his children to take care of their parents. That's, one, that's what honor thy father and mother entails. And I'll show you that in 1 Timothy 5, I'll show you a couple of passages just to make this case. But we see here in 1 Timothy 5, where the church is told to honour widows that are widows indeed. So the church can take on widows and take care of them, actually provide for them if they are taken into the fold. But if any widow have children or nephews, let them learn first to show piety at home and to requite their parents, for this is good and acceptable for God. So you see here it's saying, it's not just being accepted and honoured in the church, because why is it saying, hey, well, if you have children or nephews, so even so, this is interesting that, you know, there's even an obligation there to take care of aunties, right? <laughs> Things like that. Because it's saying here that if a widow needs work and she's being taken care of by the church, but it's saying if it's possible, if she has children, see, they're expected to requite their parents, right? So this is not just respect, this is providing for the widows. So you see how like they are expected to provide for them and even also like you know there is nephews too for that is good and acceptable before god now she that is a widow indeed and desolate trusteth in god and continueth in supplications and prayers night and day but she that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth and these things give in charge that they may be blameless now look now we know this passage is talking about providing for your family but specifically it's talking about the church providing for those in need but if any provide not for his own and especially for those of his own house, he has denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. What is it saying? Is if you don't fulfill your financial obligations, you are worse than an unbeliever. That's what the Bible's saying here. And same with the church. If a church does not look after people that actually need help, not the lazy, there's a difference between people that are lazy, right, and they're in trouble. They're, they're the people that disfellowship. These are people that are trying to live, right, and they're not making ends meet. If the church doesn't take care of them, if we don't take care of them, the Bible says we're worse than the unbelievers. So, if any provide not for us, so, so this is obviously providing financially, providing material things. So that's why this honouring widows is not just respecting them. So we see this honouring your father and mother is not just with the respect, it's also providing for them. Look here in Matthew 15, look what Jesus says. Then came to Jesus scribes and Pharisees, which were of Jerusalem, saying, Why do thy disciples transgress the trans tradition of the elders? For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. But he answered and said unto them, why do ye also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? For God commanded, saying, Honour thy father and mother, and he that curseth father or mother, let him die the death. But ye say, Whosoever shall say to his father or his mother, look at this, it is a gift. 
by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, and honor not his father or his mother. So what is it saying here? He's saying here that, you know, because he's comparing, they're saying, oh, why are your disciples eating without washing their hands? You're breaking our traditions. And he's saying, like, well, you have a tradition where you give something to your parents and you say, hey, this is a gift I'm giving to you, as opposed to an obligation, a debt that is owed to them because of what they've done for you. That's the sin here. Saying, hey, 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 what I'm giving you is a gift. This is something you didn't deserve. It's out of my goodness that I'm giving this to you. He's saying, no, no, when, you're, when you give something to your mother and father to take care of them, it's not a gift anymore. You owe that to them. You're obligated. Is it a gift? By whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me. And look at this, and honour not. So you see how it's linking up that honour there? His father or his mother. He shall be free, right? Like free from what? The debt, the obligation to your parents. Thus have you made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. So what is he saying? See how he gives like these two passages that talk about respect that parents deserve, right? Because remember, honour thy father and mother. Remember, curseth, whosoever curseth father and mother shall die. So in the Old Testament laws, there's a verse that says, if you curse father or mother, you can be stoned. If you smite your father or mother, you can be stoned. So that's the sort of reverence that your parents deserve. And that's why he's saying it's such a sin for people to think that you give them something and you're doing them a favour when you actually owe it to them. Honour not his father or his mother, he shall be free. Thus have you made the commandment of God none effect by your tradition. Um, I'll go there in a second. So let's think about some examples because that, that verse there, I just want to talk about examples. So how do people prioritize family before God? So obviously it comes God, then family, but some people, how do they prioritize family before God? Let's think about some examples. And I think one of the main examples I think of when we're talking about like real biblical family, prioritizing over God, is maybe when uh, you're in an unequally yoked marriage and the wife says, should I go to church if my husband doesn't like me going to church? You guys ever, you, I mean, everyone's come across that example, right? Like, should a woman go to church if her husband doesn't want her to go to church? Or what if, like, he's even violent? You know, I could get in trouble. I could get, in, like, like be beaten if I, if I practice my Christianity and whatnot. I'll give you my thoughts on that situation. So... It, should a woman still go to church, read her Bible, you know, pray and do those things if her husband forbids it? I think yes. You know, and I know maybe some people think like, oh, what sort of trouble she's going to. I understand that like people can be in dangerous situations, right? Like if they, if, or it could, it could like uh, put a rift in that marriage, right? Where you're trying to do what's right, you're doing it respectfully, you're, you're not trying to cause an argument, but it's just, you know, maybe like, it, like think about it in like a Muslim scenario and like a scenario where, you know, they're against that religion. Well, they're going to have a problem and it could, you know, it could get violent, it could get really, really bad. Now, should she still try, strive to do that? I think yes. Um, now, if it gets violent in any sort of domestic abuse scenario, and I'm talking about real domestic abuse, right? I'm not talking about, you know, because nowadays when you read about domestic abuse, you know, it's just women that didn't want to do what Ephesians 5 is saying, right? Like Ephesians 5 says to obey your husband, submit to your husband, and then you read like these articles from women that are like, oh, I was living in this abusive relationship for years and it was just, she didn't want to do what her husband was saying. Like, that, that's not an abusive relationship, that's a biblical relationship. An abusive relationship is when it's violent, right? He's doing things that are sinful and things like that. So. When we're talking about violent relations, there's nothing wrong with a woman getting out of harm's way, right? So this is where I think there may be some wrong teaching in Christianity where, like, if the husband's violent, beating his wife for no reason, beating her because she's going to church and whatnot, that's when you, you're not obligated to be in that house, right? Where it's, there's violent, there's assault taking place because that's like a criminal charge, right? So you can get out of harm's way and, and separate. Um, so I'm not trying to encourage like divorces here, because it's not about divorce. It's about physically separating yourself, right? So I'm not saying you divorce your husband. I'm saying if he's unsafe or he's unreasonable, he's beating you up, you just say like, I'm doing everything right, I'm still getting beaten. You know, that's where you get away from that, right? You need to get away from that and you may have to physically separate. Now there might be a milder case where it's just friction in the family. You think, well, you know, if I try and live for God, my marriage is going to suffer. And that's what I think 1 Corinthians, 15, uh, 1 Corinthians 7 is really addressing. 
It's really addressing like when you have a, a spouses, but one is like an unbeliever and one is trying to live for God and now there's friction. Well, should somebody, think about our priorities. You know, we're talking about God first, then family. Should somebody, like in an unweekly yoke relationship, put, the, put that relationship over their relationship with God? No, because that should be prioritized. As hard as that is to fathom and to practice, that's, that's really what the Bible teaches. We seek first the kingdom of God. Now when you think about that scenario and you think about 1 Corinthians 7, it actually puts this passage into context of the sort of scenario that somebody trying to put God first and living right can actually create. And that's this friction between husband and wife. 1 Corinthians 7, And unto the married command, I command, yet not I, but the Lord, let not the wife depart from her husband. But and if she depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband, and let not the husband put away his wife. So what is it saying here? That if there is a physical separation between husband and wife, that's not the same as divorce. See, divorce in the Bible, like a biblical divorce, is when the marriage vow is nullified, right? It's not this worldly divorce where you can get divorced for any reason, right? Because if you go get a legal divorce and you're not biblically divorced, which is saving for the cause of fornication, that's why Jesus says if you put away your wife and marry another, you commit adultery. Why? Because you're not actually divorced. But he says saving for the cause of fornication. So this isn't a sermon on divorce, but this one is, this is why when you're departing from your husband, it doesn't mean you're getting divorced. It just means that if they separate physically, they're still married. That's why it says, if she departs, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to your husband. So they're your two options. If you're apart from your husband or you're apart from your wife, is you either remain unmarried, right? which is obviously is not ideal because you should be reconciled, right? So the other option is that you're reconciled to her. Or him. Let not the husband put away his wife. But to the rest speak I, not the Lord. If any brother, so if, so this is now the scenario, if any brother hath a wife that believeth not, and she be pleased to dwell with him, let him not put her away. So this is what it's saying. You don't just separate just because he's an unbeliever, because if he's an unbeliever, but he's happy for you to live your Christian life and go to church, and you know, you're still fulfilling your obligations as a husband or a wife then that's fine. Then you have peace in that house, right? He says, And the woman which hath an husband that believeth not, and if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. What, what do I think this means? What I think it means is that that marriage can have peace. The, uh, I'll try and explain it this way. I know it's more complicated than that, but what I think, what I think generally this is saying is that marriage can be like sanctified and different and holy and separate and, you know, and, and godly if at least one of those two people is saved and doing the right thing. That's what I think this is talking about. So it's saying like, even though you have an unbelieving husband, doesn't care about the things of God, but if you are a believing wife living for God, you can... You can like save that marriage from just going down the tube. You can save that family from just going over to Satan. And that's why I think if you have a wife that's a believer, you can sanctify the husband. The, son, the husband, believing husband, is, can be unbelieving husband can be sanctified by the wife. The unbelieving wife can be sanctified by the husband, right, and have a holy marriage. And that's why it says, "Else were your children unclean, but now are they holy." So it's sort of showing like, well. If at least one parent is doing right by God, you can raise your children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. As long as the hu husband's pleased to draw. So if you have like a sort of amic, you know, like a, a, a peaceable, unbelieving spouse, and you can live for God, you know, you can, you have the power, if you live for God, to raise your children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. That's what I think this sort of passage is referring to when it talks about being sanctified. Your family being sanctified, your family being holy, your children being holy. But if the unbelieving depart, let him depart. So let's go back to the context. Is if you're trying to live for God, like you know the whole, or well, if you go to church, your husband's going to be upset. You go to church, your wife's going to be upset. It's going to be friction. That's what I believe. This is the context of in Corinthians. They're saying, well, if there's friction and there's just constant, there's no peace in the home, and you don't depart as the believer. But the unbeliever says, you know what, you religious nut, I'm done, I'm, I'm, I'm leaving. 
that's what this passage is talking about. It says if he wants to depart, let him depart. A brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God hath called us to peace. So what is it saying here? Is if the relationship with God clashes with the relationship with your spouse and the unbelieving spouse says, you know what, I'd rather just be apart. What it's saying here is the believer doesn't have to feel like this obligation to keep pursuing and keeping them together. So in the house, there's just this constant fighting, saying it's fine to just to separate, be separate physically so that there's peace. You can live for God. They do their thing. But you remain married, and hopefully one day you can be reconciled to your husband or wife. Because hopefully one day... That's why it says, For what knowest thou, O wife, whether thou shalt save thy husband? Well, how knowest thou, O man, whether thou shalt save thy wife? So it's not the unbelieving departs and okay they've deserted me now i can go get married to somebody else and live my life no if your unbelieving partner departs you remain unmarried or you be reconciled to them because hopefully one day they'll get saved they'll come to their senses and then you'll be back together and you'll have a god glorifying marriage so why am i going through that passage because i'm just trying to put in perspective to you like that that scenario because a lot of people wonder about that scenario do I potentially sacrifice the peace in my family to live for God? As hard as it is, yes, I think you, you do. You put God first. Um, and then I think that's why that passage is there too. So you can, like I said, you can respect your parents even though you don't obey them. Um, you can provide for your kids. And why? Because one day your kids even may grow up and no, not live for God. You know? So you still put God first before them. You still put your spouse first before them. Uh, what's another example? Another example is like school or sports events for children on Sundays. That's one way people, you know, they think, they, they, they think oh, I've got to provide for my kids, you know, and they're providing for them so much that they do all these things for their kids, and then they put their kids into something that happens on Sunday. Now, what do you do in that scenario? Well, I've got to take them on Sunday because that's, that's where they are. No, you've got to put God first. You forgo that. Because it's more important that your kids are following God than taking part in some sport or something that they have to do on a Sunday, right? Some other thing. All right, let's continue. Hopefully this sermon's interesting because it might be a bit long. <laughs> Number three is your spiritual family. So God, family, real biblical family. Second, is, third is your spiritual family, right? And that comes above... Uh, your extended family and friends and whatnot. And this is one thing that we have to stress because your example to the people here and your presence here is more important than your presence with extended family and friends. And that's something in our culture that's very hard to get over. And I'll talk about that in a moment. I won't spend too much time on these verses, but we talked about this last week where, you know, Jesus' brethren come in asking for him and he says, who is my mother? Who are my brethren? He looked round about on them which sat up about him and said behold my mother and my brethren for whosoever shall do the will of god the same is my brother and my sister and my mother so you see here jesus even prioritizing the family of god above his own physical extended family right even his mother his brothers his sisters look at here in luke when somebody and i mentioned this last week but i wanted to show you luke 11 it came to pass as he spake these things a certain woman of the company lifted up her voice. This is the first Catholic in the Bible, right? This woman. He says, It said unto him, Blessed is the womb that bare thee, and the paps which thou hast sucked. So you see here, this woman is saying, Oh man, the woman that bare Jesus Christ is so blessed because you, you sucked her paps and her womb bare you. Look how Jesus responds. But he said, Yea, rather, what does that mean? Even more blessed than the womb that bare him and the paps that he sucked. Yea, rather, blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. So isn't it interesting that, you know, we put our extended family and friends up. Some people put Mary on a pedestal just because she bore the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus says, you know what, even more blessed is the people that hear the word of God and keep it. Those are believers. Look here. Galatians 6, as we therefore have opportunity, as we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. So here we're trying to do good, but look, he specifically says, even more so, those who are of the household of faith. 
not those who are of the household of our bloodline. You see, so it's very clear in the Bible that the spiritual family, and I understand because we don't always walk by faith, we walk by sight. And I understand that the, the bonds there with our physical family and friends are really strong. But this is something where you grow in spiritually, where you start to realize, you know what? My spiritual bonds are actually thicker than my blood bonds, right? And this is what's being taught in the Bible. And as you grow in your faith, you'll realize that. Because as you grow in your walking in the spirit, you'll realize that the fleshly bonds are not as strong as the spiritual bonds. And you'll start to appreciate your spiritual family and the role they play in your life. That's why it's so important that you treat them more important than, and we treat each other. We love one another even more so than we love our physical extended family. Now, God, family, spiritual family. But what are some examples where people prioritize their spiritual family above their physical family and when you think about that you think about preachers ministers and bishops serving the ministry serving the body of christ even more so than their own family now you wonder why our church has one sunday a week you know some people criticize our church for having to go oh you know why do you guys only have one why do you guys only have one service a week why don't you have the sunday morning the sunday night the wednesday night you know multiple soul winning times throughout the week all run by me that's because i'm not prioritizing my spiritual family over my family and you know what happens a lot with preachers that do that and they follow that pattern how many times do you hear that they either like family just goes to it goes bad they didn't spend any time with their kids because they just put them in their Sunday school their whole life, put them in Christian school. You know, their wife gets so bitter because they're, they're always choosing the ministry over them. And even the most spiritual woman, guys, one day will, you know, if you don't spend time with her and invest some time in that relationship, even the most spiritual woman will start to think, you know, I'm getting bitter <laughs> that my husband, you know, loves the ministry. Because well, she's because they, they might always think of it as well, oh, it's because he's serving God, and that's the right mindset, right? The right mindset for a woman is well, we are serving God together, I'm supporting him, getting behind him. And you need to make sure that relationship stays that way because if the relationship's not good, what the woman now start in her flesh starts thinking, You love the church members more, than you love you love those people. She starts seeing the people rather than the God that you're serving, and that's what can happen if they if that's neglected, if he prioritizes the 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 people over his family so we think about preachers but that doesn't just happen to people in full-time ministry that can happen to zealous christians as well it's kind of like a good problem to have in the sense that you'd rather somebody zealous than some somebody that's like lukewarm and not doing anything right i'd rather i'd rather talk to somebody who's like zealous and neglecting his family try and pull him back a little bit than try and like pull somebody up to like come on do something do something for God. You know, stop being so selfish and stop being so self-centered. Um, but that can happen too where, you know, and I've seen it even happen like in our circle where soul winners, think about, this is a really practical example. You're out soul winning. You're getting into some good conversations. You know, but people are depending on you for a lift. You know, like do you just keep talking. Do you love that unsafe person so much that you're neglecting your spiritual family do you love like what about like you know maybe you're out soul winning and like your wife needs to get picked up from somewhere or you, your wife's waiting for you to get picked up take the kids home because you got kids out i've done this before myself so i'm not just downing on anyone here where it's like man but you're so zealous you love god man you're gonna go you preach and you spend hours and hours it's getting dark your family needs to get home your family needs to get home prepared to, you know like you have obligations so i they, they made that mistake Right, where you have prioritized the spiritual family over your physical family, which shouldn't be the case. That's why, like, you know, I, I always think of myself as a Christian first, that's God. I'm a husband second, I'm a father third, and fourth, I'm a bishop. Because as a bishop, I'm shepherding the flock, but they, they, you guys aren't more important than my kids and my wife, right? So that's just the priority. I'm not saying you guys aren't important, that's just I have to keep that priorities right because that's how i'm commanded to prioritize them um, and you got to think even if you're not a bishop you need to think about that too if you're doing something to serve the body of christ you need to make sure it's not to the neglect of 
your physical family, which is your spouse and your kids and the obligations that you have, not to extended family. So it's church ministry commitments affecting your marriage and your obligations, soul winnings, events, positions within the church. So, you know, we have a lot of events at church, but there are some things. I don't see church as optional. Like this meeting here is not optional. This is compulsory. But we have social events. Those are optional. Would I love you to come along? Of course. Is there value in you being there? Yes, because if we can strengthen the relationships here, it's better. But if it's, I don't want you so involved in church that your marriage is going down the tube. <laughs> you know what I mean? I don't want you so involved in church that you're neglecting your children. You know, so you need to make sure that you keep that balance there. All right, last one is your carnal relationships. So I just lump this into one. Now this, this includes your extended family. Friends, colleagues, teammates. Carnal, what do I mean by fleshly? I think of this word carnal, I think of when I was in Mexico. And they use this word to describe like really close friends. Right, remember? Mi carnal, that's what they say, because it's like, this is my, my buddies, you know, my BFFs. It's mi, mi carnal. So isn't that funny that mi carnal, my fleshly buddy, or my spirit, not necessarily my spiritual buddy, right? So your carnal relationships, and you know why? Because we're not just naturally spiritual. That's why these ones are so strong, right? Because when you're in the flesh, it's the ones that entertain you, you grew up with, you got that bond, right? We're like buddies! Sometimes those buddies are not a good influence on you. But I understand that these relationships can be really close. And the Bible even talks about it, right? Proverbs 18. A man that hath friends must show himself friendly, and there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. So look at this, that you have like extended family, like your brothers and sisters, but the Bible says here that you can have friendship that is even closer than that, right? There's a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. Look, a, fr a friend loveth at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. So yeah, you may come up and you guys, you guys are bros, right? But that doesn't necessarily mean that your friends and your mates are pushing you in the right direction now, now that you are trying to live spiritually, right? Because back before when you were living in the flesh, you were really good mates. Now you're trying to live in the spirit. Are they still a good friend that's loving at all times, pushing you in the right direction? And we don't want to be naive about our carnal relationships. 1 Corinthians 15, Be not deceived, evil communications corrupt good manners. Right? So if we spend too much time around these carnal relationships, they rub off on you. Your priorities start to go lower. And notice, like... God, family, spiritual family, carnal relationships. It's these carnal relationships really that start crowding out the top three that should come first. Why? Because it's these carnal relationships where you have family get-togethers, right? Birthdays, weddings, parties and celebrations. Everyone's got some celebration to go to. And you know what's interesting about these carnal relationships? Is they grow as time goes on. Why? Because you get married, now you've got four grandparents. You know, you got all your aunties and uncles, they've got their grandparents. And then they have their kids, and then you got their kids and have kids. You see how these carnal relationships grow so you don't realize that that is your priorities God, family, church, a spiritual family. These carnal relationships, what will inevitably be happening is these carnal relationships will just overcrowd the rest of them, right? So I want to just give you an object lesson. I want to just finish this sermon with a bit of an object lesson that I've got here. And this is something that's stuck with me my whole life uh, when I learned about priorities, right? So I've got just three things here. I don't know, maybe you've seen this before in uh, maybe other sort of success talks and whatnot. It's the same object lesson, but the same principle. Well, how I want to apply it is, if you want to have a fulfilling, successful spiritual life, how you can think about making sure you have the priorities so that it's fulfilling. Now, I've got a bag here of little stones. So I've got some sort of medium-sized stones, and I have three tennis balls because I didn't have bigger rocks, right? These are the bigger things that I can have. So let's say this represents, I've got three here, so I just said, hey, let's, let's say this represents God, right? Father, Word, Holy Ghost. <laughs> so this represents God. 
And let's say this represents, these rocks represent category two and three. So you're like your family, your, your children, your spiritual family. So there's differing degrees of importance, but these are like the big items in your physical life, right? Right, in your spiritual life. And this is the rest. This is like all your carnal relationships, right? So these are the small things that are not so important. You should be prioritizing the least, right? And these can grow. So I mean, if I had, I have more of these, I didn't bring them. But if I, like we could just keep adding to this, right? Because as time goes on, there's a lot of this stuff. Now, let's say this jar represents your spiritual life. And you want to have a full spiritual life. Well, if you don't prioritize right, right? So let's say we start filling this jar and we say, you know, I'm going to do these carnal relationships first. I'm putting them first. Make sure I get, I got, I got to go to that engagement party. I got to go to that wedding. I got to go to that birthday party. Man, we grew up together. That, all those little things that you do. Let's say we put those in first. Right? And then you say, well, I, now I've done all those things. I've got to like put my important things, you know, like family, my children, making sure that I'm working so they're provided for. Now when what's left and you say, oh, now I've got to do things for God, there's, there's no space anymore, right? There's no space to get this in. But if you prioritize your life correctly, so let me take these out and just do this again. So the same amount of stuff you can see if I don't prioritize it correctly, doesn't fit into the jar. But, let's pour this out. But if I take the exact same amount of things, right, and I put God first into the jar, then I put the lesser important things than God, which is like family and spiritual family, things like that. And now, if I, the remainder of the time, I do these other little obligations, right? Which are, you know, because it's not saying you can't, it's not saying you can't go to the wedding. It's not saying you can't go to the engagement party. It's not saying you can't go to the gender reveal or the things like that, but you need, if you want a successful spiritual life, it's about priorities, right? And as you start to fill your life with these things, so think about your schedule, right? Your schedule. When we think about the week, Sunday we make sure we're at church. We make sure we're setting a good example for God's family. And now, as we work around the rest of our schedule, we see, all right, well, if I have a Saturday off, I can go to that birthday party. I can go to that, you know, sports carnival. I can go to the, you know, the tournaments on the weekend. I can go to the wedding, you know, the gender reveal, all that sort of stuff. I can go take a mate out for lunch. But you know what? It's not to the neglect. of your spiritual life. Okay? So that illustration has always stuck with me to remind me how I should be filling my life. If you fill your life first with priority number four, you're going to crowd out the more important things in your life. But, you know what, you'll probably end up feeling more in your life, right? Because if you're living for God first, you'll be better organized with your time and all that sort of stuff. If you put God first, then the important things, and you fit all the lesser important things around, that's how you can have spiritual success. All right, let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for uh, your word. Thank you for the reminder that we need to seek first the kingdom of God. And I just pray, Lord, for everyone here. I pray, Lord, that this uh, sermon would be a good reminder for them or a wake-up call, Lord to make sure that they always put you first into the jar and fit all the lesser important things around that priority. Help us to have spiritually successful and fulfilling lives, Lord. 
We need help because we are but mere humans. Help us not to walk in the flesh, but in the Spirit. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.